Um, this is one of my favorite weekends of the year, partly because I get to come to my hometown, Seattle. I love Seattle so much. It is so great to be here. And also because I am in a room with hundreds of people who are working to make the world a better place, and there is nothing I like more than that. And can we just say, what about the Seattle Center? Do you guys remember how gross this place used to be? <laughs> it is so great. I mean, the Seattle Center is living proof of how things can be better when people are working together. Um, it's fabulous to see the strollers, the art. I remember it used to be like a crystal meth place. Now it's like absolutely beautiful. Look at the potential we have when we work together. <laughs> Um, so like our first speaker, Howard, this morning talked about how he's new to citizen engagement, I am also new to citizen engagement. I'm a new convert and recruit. What I'm really come out of the environmental movement. I, if you've seen my movie, you know I am obsessed with stuff. Uh, before getting into the citizen engagement world, I spent the last 20 years tracking where all the stuff in our life comes from and where it goes. I actually visited 40 countries and visited hundreds of factories to see where our stuff is made and where our stuff is thrown away when we're done with it. So I got to see firsthand the hidden environmental and social and health costs of the way that we make and use and throw away stuff. And it's not pretty. There are a lot of problems out there. I summarized what I learned in a film called The Story of Stuff. I'm just curious, how many people here have seen that? Oh, a lot of you. Excellent. If you haven't seen it, you can see it at storyofstuff.org. I made this 20-minute film, put it online, and to my utter amazement, it was a huge hit. Who knew that now 20 million people would want to watch a movie about where our stuff comes from and where it goes? So I was stunned at the, the viewership, but I was also really interested in the response. Our small team got flooded with emails and letters from people all over the country. And the number one question they asked was, what can I do? Or really heartbreakingly, they often shared a sense of complete lack of power and overwhelm, and they said, there's nothing I can do. Um, and I realized that the problem now is not that people don't know about the problem. The problem is that they don't know what to do about it. So I was very curious as I traveled around the country showing the story of stuff and talking about these issues, I was very curious when people would raise their hands and say, what can I do? So um, first I started listing off all these different campaigns. I mean, there's a million possible things we could do. You know, one of the good things about such a gigantic problem that we're facing is there's so many things to do, you don't even have to do something boring. Like, there's a lot of things we could do. But after a while, I got curious why people were not figuring out what they wanted to do themselves. So I turned the question back on them. And I asked them, well, what can you think of doing? And across the country, the answers I got were so consistent. People would raise their hand and eagerly say, I can carry my own bag to the grocery store. I can ride a bike. I can buy organic. I can recycle. I can buy a Prius. I can change my light bulbs. All of these things about minor lifestyle adjustments or different purchasing habits. Now, those are all very, very good things to do. You all live in Seattle, so I know you already do all of those things. I do all of those things. We should all do all of those things. We should compost and not buy bottled water and all of that. It's like, duh, of course you should do that. But those things do not fall in the category of working together for the level of big, bold, systemic change that we need right now right now. Those things sort of fall in the category of responsible adult hygiene. It's like you, you floss your teeth, you compost your waste. You wash your hands after you use the toilet, you carry your own bag to the grocery store. This is like basic adult functioning at this point. What I realized traveling around the country talking to people was that we all have two different parts of ourselves. It's almost like two muscles. We have a consumer muscle and a citizen muscle. Now that consumer muscle is spoken to and validated and nurtured so much from day one, and anyone with children knows it is like literally from day one. We are so indoctrinated into being a consumer that that muscle is really developed well. We are good consumers, we know we know in this country how to buy stuff. You could get on your handheld device and order any product in the world and get it delivered to your house probably by the time you get home tonight. We're really good at that. And as a result, that's become our number one identity. We are called upon to use that muscle every day. But meanwhile, our citizen muscle has atrophied. And there's a bunch of dangers in this. One of the dangers is that when we are faced with problems as enormous as disruption of the global climate, that's really big. Or uh, problems as enormous as babies now being born pre-polluted with an average of 250 industrial chemicals 
already in their blood when they are born. That's a really big problem. And the best that we can think of doing is carrying our own bag to the grocery store. So to, to, to build the power to change problems this great, we've got to swap this. That is what we want. We need to start rebuilding our citizen muscles. And in a lot of ways, it doesn't even matter what it is that you want to work on, just so that we can start building those muscles. You know, we learn to win by winning. So we need to start stepping out of our consumer self into our citizen self and building that muscle. In order to do that, the Story of Stuff is launching a new project that we are really excited about and for which we really need your input. So look on your table for the um, Story of Stuff sheets of paper. You're going to be needing those in a moment. There's a couple of papers, paper clip together. We are launching a Citizen Muscle Boot Camp. And we are going to get people to start using those citizen muscles again. And we invite all of you to help us design and test this boot camp. There are lots of great activist trainings, lots of great campaigner trainings. What we want to do is take the best of those existing trainings, but scale it up. The best trainings out there now rely on getting small groups of people together in person. In the Story of Stuff community, which I hope includes lots of you, if not, please sign up on our website, storyofstuff.org. There's a little button that says join our community. We now have over 400,000 people in that community. Sadly, we just cannot get everybody together in small in-person groups. So we are going to pull the best of online and the best of on land, education and training and organizing, and scale it up. And our goal is to run hundreds of thousands of people through this six-week Citizen Muscle Boot Camp, at the end of which we will have hundreds of thousands of people with a beefed up citizen muscle ready to go out and make some change. The Citizen Muscle Boot Camp has six parts of it. The first part is what we call our Oprah Week. This is where you get in touch with your inner citizen, with your inner change maker. This is where you, you think deeply and hard and find your passion. There are an infinite number of things that we can work on. And if you find that thing that is your passion, then getting up every morning to work on it is a joy and a blessing rather than a chore. If you do not have a passion, we have a number that we would like to suggest to you. But we re it really works the best if you find something that turns you on. For me, it's fighting garbage. If you, if you don't have a passion, just try garbage. It's really fascinating. It is super, super interesting in how many different aspects of society it's touched you. But it might be something else. It might be getting organic food in your kid's school. It might be getting bike lanes. It might be getting corporate money out of politics. Whatever it is, there are so many things to work on. We have like a smorgasbord buffet of all the problems you can possibly choose to address. So you can pick whatever turns you on. So the first week of our boot camp is, is connecting with your passion. It is a long, hard journey ahead, and if you're connected with your passion, it's going to be way more fun. Then we go through four different skill sets that citizens need. Next slide, please. The four skill sets that this boot camp will run people through is talk, grow, target, and push. Now, this is where we want your input. There are just piles and piles of information on, how, on each one of these things. Great trainings, great guidance. What we want to know is what things in each of this category do you most need? We want you to think about a time that you were making change and you wished your skill set, you wished your citizen muscle was stronger. Let's look at each one of them quickly. Talk. Do people's eyes glaze over when you talk about the issues that are important to you? Are you often not invited back to dinner parties? Um, <laughs> do you write letters to the editors that never get pun published? I mean, that was me for many years. I will tell you, I was at a dinner party a few years ago, and this guy comes up to me and he said, oh, I heard you know a lot about garbage incineration. That is my favorite entree line ever. I was like, I do. And I just laid it off. And then I looked over, and my next door neighbors were in the corner cracking up. They had told this guy, you want to see something funny? Go ask her about garbage incinerators. <laughs> That's when I learned that if my passion had become a source of entertainment for my neighbors, I needed to work on how I talked about it. So we will have a section on um, talking. I want you guys to think about what communication skills and practices do you need to better communicate your passion. Grow. What skills and, and um, tools do you need to grow your group? That one of the common questions we get or complaints we get from people in our community who contact us is they say, I'm only one person. 
I said, well, make a friend, and then all of a sudden you have doubled that. <laughs> make another friend. Just keep going. It is so much easier to do this if we get more people involved, easier and more fun. So what skills do you need to help you recruit and enroll others? is target. Okay, you've got your passion. You've got your friends. Now you've got to figure out where's the most strategic place to intervene. Where are the leverage points to make the greatest change? You don't want to just be blindly flailing on your issue. You want to be strategic and effective in where you intervene. And the final slide, next slide, is push. You've got your, your passion. You've got your message honing your communication skills down. You've got your group of people. You know the strategic leverage points. Now let's go do it. So those are the four skill set modules in our Citizen Muscle Boot Camp. Then the final week is where you are going to go out into the world and do this. Throughout the boot camp, it will be multimedia. Each week, there will be short things to read, videos to watch, podcasts to listen to, and exercises. You cannot build a muscle without doing exercises that use that muscle. And that's why we say this boot camp is online and on land. We'll learn about these skills, and then you will go out into the world and build that muscle. Um, now, we believe that no one is as smart as everyone. And so whenever we do things, we really turn to our community for input. So I am going to take a break here. You guys are going to sit as a group. We're going to have 20 minutes to discuss this. So that's about five minutes each. Five minutes each for talk, grow, target, and push. On your sheet of paper, if you guys found your papers, I want someone in your table to be a note taker and highlight what are the skills and tools and resources that you most need, that you want this Citizen Muscle Boot Camp. There's a second sheet of paper for people to sign up to be beta testers. Over the spring and summer, we are going to run teams of volunteers that want to be beta testers through different iterations of this boot camp. Sign up if you want to be one of these beta testers. But if you do that, you have to agree to give us feedback on what worked and what didn't and how it could be better. So I will come back in 20 minutes. We will wrap up and hear some reports back about some of the highlights from your table. Thank you guys so much. Uh, and before we uh, start drawing out some of the uh, juicy stuff from your table conversations, uh, um, there are a few things that, a Annie, I think you wanted just to, uh, to, to uh, emphasize and underscore about the Citizen Boot Camp. I wanted to make sure that folks signed up if you want to beta test this, because we really are relying on your expertise about what works and what doesn't. I also wanted to introduce Allison Cook, who's way over there. If she could just stand up. Allison is my coworker at the Story of Stuff Project, and she is coordinating this um, boot camp development. So she'll be here all day today. Her email's up there. If you have other ideas or input that we don't get to today, please do not hesitate to contact her, because we really want to make this a collaborative effort. Uh, great. Well, um, let's dive in and hear from some of the uh, table hosts and table conversations. Uh, Chris, got one over here. Great. I'll stand up. Thank you, Chris. Um, hi, my name is Webb Hutchins. Uh, you, also, my, my teacher name is Hutch. My teacher is sports name, so I don't know what name to use in this crowd. Um, but I am sitting with a bunch of teachers, so I'll go with Hutch. And I just wanted to say, um, we were talking about kids, and, because there's a lot of teachers here and people into art and civics and those sorts of things. And so we talked about how to appeal to kids. Um, and we, we kind of came up with uh, a little Venn diagram. One appeared in my mind. On one side was self-interest, and on the other side was the common good. And how do we get kids to move towards the middle to start talking and growing and taking action? So um, that was one of the things we came up with. And I just wanted to say um, that I have this civics initiative in which speaks to these um, needs for our kids. And uh, I get nervous when I talk to big groups but not with kids. So anyways, um, there's something if you want, you can do like that other guy said from Huffington Post, load this on your machine right now. There's a beautiful website. It's called Civics for All. Nice. Civics for All. And that's a F-O-R. And I think you'll love it. And what it is, it's an initiative that I've talked to Eric about and a lot of um, the school board members support it. Bruce Harrell supports it and I'm sure you will. So if you go online and check it out, it's an initiative with the uh, school district to um, get social studies. Um, actually, Carol Coe, who spoke earlier from our state social studies department, she's amazing, great Web, supporter. Thank you, thank you very much for, yeah. for, for that. Um, um, and okay. so Civics for All is a website, and I want to hear from some other folks and your table conversations in response to, in response to Annie's uh, 
prompts. Uh, uh, oh, Janae, over here. Hi, I'm Aisha Khanna with Points of Light. We have a fabulous round table of citizen activists who came together through Occupy and uh, graphic designers and educators. Um, and um, we talked, we had a lot of discussion around communication skills and practices um, and talked about how do you talk to people who have completely different opinion? How do I not be so angry and sort of enroll others and how we, I speak and not show my frustration? Um, how do we continue to keep the passion going and show small successes and celebrate those successes, bring more joy and sort of energy? Um, what's the exact right amount I need to talk about something so I can get enroll people with emotion but get to the point um, quickly? And then how do I talk about things in other people's self-interest? So great discussions, some models that we shared, citizen activation stations uh, where, they've made th where we've made things fun and engaging to enroll others, using social media. Media. And then we did say, even though we've talked a lot about engaging youth, how about those of us that are older, as Jeff said, and how do we um, enroll those that have talent and wisdom, have time, and they really want to contribute? So let's not forget. Um, but great conversation, good idea. Fantastic, wonderful, and a, a common theme here, too. So uh, Chris, over on this side. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Susan Griffin, National Council for the Social Studies. Our table identified exactly all those things, and in addition to that, um, we're looking at targets, what skills and practices we need, resources for finding the experts to help you solve the problem, how to navigate through uh, a system to make sure that you're talking to the right people, um, a digital process for finding experts. How can you, how and where do you post something so that you can find answers? And finding an ambassador to help you understand how and where to go for solutions. Fantastic. Um, Annie, I want to give you a chance here because um, one thing that you were noticing as you were circulating around the room uh, is that even prior to or perhaps part of your first uh, uh, step here of talk um, was listen uh, and that uh, the art of citizenship uh, and, and building this capacity to engage each other uh, begins with that. And I wonder if you want to just reflect a bit on what you heard there and then respond to some of these themes that have come up in these uh, comments. Yeah, I was happy that the first three tables that I eavesdropped on all were talking about listening. And that is a really important first step before we start to use our citizen muscles because if we listen, we can learn how to frame our informations and passions and concerns in a way that is relevant. I, I find that often, especially environmentalists, we are sort of trapped in this myth that the truth will set us free. And so we bombard people with the truth all the time. And the reason I say it's a myth is that if the truth would set us free, we'd be free. Like we got reams of truth about the problems with the climate. And then what we do though is we bombard people with this data and then they don't respond and then we blame them. Like what's the matter with you? Didn't you look at my pie chart? Didn't you look at my gra graph? Let's, I'm gonna make a new graph with three colors this time instead of two. And maybe that will inspire you. And, and so I'm, I was really glad to hear people talking about listening and, and framing our stuff in a way that will be heard. Because it doesn't matter if we are the smartest person on the planet about some issue, if we are unable to talk about it in a way that connects with other folks. And I, I just thank you so much for the input that you guys are giving on this boot camp so far. Um, uh, let, let's hear, hear maybe one, one or two more. Uh, Janae, over here. Hi, my name is Doug Snyder and I'm with Seattle Youth Traffic Court. And I was just wondering about the push factor. Um, once you've gathered your group, once you've found a cause to go for, how do you find the source of the problem or a source that can help you fix this? Okay. Well, um, before we do that, let's just hear from one other, uh, if there's another uh, Chris on this side. Uh, um, yeah. uh, Max Sugarman from UW. And we were really interested in how on that uh, growing side, how do we engage people who wouldn't normally just show up? And getting a diverse range of people into your enrollment. Great. going to speak to those two. Those are both really good. Those are like probably two of the most important things that a, an active citizen has to deal with. Um, even to be aware that, that we have certain obstacles that can turn people away, even that is a big um, bit of progress for our side. We've often had meetings in times that are not geographically or scheduled in a convenient way or we're using vocabulary in a way that is not attractive to people. And then again, we wonder what's the matter with them that they aren't coming. So it's really important that we choose vocabulary, that we choose speakers that represent the community, that we choose physical locations that are easy for people to come to, that we provide things like childcare so that single working mothers can come, that we make it fun. 
I mean, nobody wants to come be an eco-martyr here. We want to have fun while we are changing the world. I feel like the planet is heading off an ecological cliff. We don't have to have a bad day, too. Like, let's have fun while we're figuring out what we're going to do about this. So those are really important kind of considerations. People will come if it's fun, if they feel heard, if they feel valued, if, if the work is happening within their comfort zone. The question about getting to the source of the problem is also really important. We were talking briefly a little earlier, and I said it's kind of like the story of the, the community that's standing at the side of the river, and they're watching all these babies float down the river, and they develop, make a really great net, and they make a crane that reaches over and picks some of the babies out, and they get these long handled nets, and then somebody says, let's go upstream and find out who's throwing the babies in the river. <laughs> and that's what we need to do. Um, we're working right now on our, our next and last film in the Story of Stuff uh, series. It's called The Story of Solutions. And it encourages viewers to think more deeply about solutions. I won't use these wonky words in the film, but there's two different kinds of solutions. There's transactional solutions and transformative solutions. Um, transactional solutions push specific solutions within the dominant paradigm. So you could um, ban a certain chemical. You could save a particular forest. Transformational solutions are those that go deeper and get to the root of the problem and say, really the root of the problem is an economic system that says that some people are expendable. The root, the root of the problem is an economic system that says that short-term corporate profit is more important than public health. So yes, we need to save those forests and ban those chemicals and increase gas mileage of cars and do all these transactional stuff, but real solutions, we've got to get to the source of the problem and redefine our society and economy so that it is one that nurtures public health, environmental well-being, and safe products. Because if we can change that sort of overriding operating system of our economy, then all the kinds of solutions that we want are going to be easy because the system is going to be set up to facilitate them. Ladies and gentlemen, Annie Leonard.